Welcome to the Digital Enterprise Society podcast, addressing all aspects of the digital enterprise, inspiring connection without boundaries and creation without limits. Thank you for tuning in. Here are your hosts, Tom Singer and Craig Brown. Well, hello there and welcome to, or heck, if you've been listening to these shows for a while, welcome back to the Digital Enterprise Society podcast. Thanks for coming along on the journey of this show that we started well over a year ago now, and it is designed to be a resource for those who work in and around PLM. The Digital Enterprise Society, it is a forum for the exchange of ideas surrounding the tools, practices, and processes used across the product lifecycle. To learn more, visit digitalenterprisesociety.org. My name is Tom Singer, and I have the honor to co-host this show every single week with Craig Brown. Craig is an industry veteran and former PLM leader at General Motors. Hey, Craig, how are you this week? Hey, I'm doing great, Tom. You know, it's it's the coming fall time and the weather is great in Michigan. Cool well, mornings, warm afternoons. It's 111 degrees in Austin, Texas, Craig. <laughs> so I appreciate that you're always you're always flouting your weather. Wait till January and then I'll get even with you. Football's not going to start, but that's a whole nother story, and we don't have time to talk about it. No, I know. Austin <laughs> Austin without Longhorn football is, is like a day without sunshine. Okay. <laughs> so every week, Craig and I, we try to bring to this podcast really interesting interviews and other ideas that are going to help all of the listeners enhance and grow their careers. And today, I'm excited because we have a, a guest who I think is, has got an interesting story and an interesting background who's doing some pretty cool things. Today, we're joined by Kevin Wright. And Kevin is the CEO and the Chief Commercial Officer at Vantage Associates. And he has actually worked in aerospace since he was in high school. They do things a little different in England. He said he was just out of high school and he went to work for a company and he never looked back. He's been in the aerospace world ever since. So uh, Kevin Wright, welcome to the Digital Enterprise Society podcast. Oh, thank you, guys. I, uh, I'm very excited to be here, and I've heard a couple of your uh, podcasts, and you have a kind of a motley crew of folks that come by, but some really, <laughs> really great conversations, and uh, it's it's wonderful to be with you here. Well, we're glad. Well, we set the standard, so make sure you follow it. Okay, <laughs> that, that's right. Welcome yeah. to the welcome to the motley crew of characters. Is I think how we'll start the show Excellent. from now on. Yeah. So, so Kevin, you know what? What is your background? You said you got into to aerospace when you were 18 and never looked back. How? How did that come about, and, and where did the path take you? Well, interestingly, in, in the UK back in the day, most folks that were involved in any form of engineering had an opportunity to be sponsored by industry. And uh, as luck would have it, I was uh, interviewed and accepted a sponsorship by Lucas Aerospace. And back then, uh, Lucas was very large in aerospace, predominantly known for uh, automotive, an automotive, uh, Lucas guys, anybody that's owned an old Jag understands Lucas. They were known as the Prince of Darkness because of their involvement in screwing <laughs> up cars. But on the- You mean, uh, the you mean it wasn't all British cars? It's just the ones with Lucas parts? Ah, oh, never yeah, mind, Lucas, go on. Lucas played a particularly interesting role in, <laughs> in darkening the lights of many cars. Anyway, okay. So um, the aerospace side was very heavily involved <laughs> in a lot of activity around engines. So my background was getting into engine control and at the time the first digital engine controls uh, mm -hmm. that, that uh, really ran on the large uh, turbine aircraft. So I spent a year with them um, going through a variety of disciplines before I hit college. And I did electronics engineering in college and interestingly uh, spending a year out first allowed me to place all of my teaching into context. I worked with uh, Lucas during the vacays and then I was offered a graduate engineering role when I graduated uh, with a bachelor's. So I spent a year with them and uh, most of that actually was spent on either black programs or commercial aircraft, mm -hmm. um, predominantly aimed at Boeing uh, platforms. And uh, as I um, moved through that activity, I was uh, responsible for the engine control for the RB211 engine that ended up being on the 747-400, which <laughs> just got retired by BA this week. And I actually reprogrammed most of those aircraft, funnily enough. So uh, I was supporting flight control and I was sent out to uh, Boeing in Seattle. And I went, uh, I went to Seattle in 1988. And I was based <laughs> online at the flight line 
And as they say, the rest was history. Uh, I was asked to come back. I declined and I stayed in the States ever since. So I've been through engineering, product support, and then merged into the murkier side of sales and, uh, and, and so forth. Mm-hmm. And a uh, variety of different companies, both public, large, multinational, multidisciplinary, and finally ended up at Vantage, which is a very small, 100% employee-owned uh, company with uh, three divisions focused uh, predominantly on either composites for the military or thermal plastics for the general aviation and commercial aviation business. Interesting. You know, Kevin, it's interesting to hear your background and, and the, uh, the one point I wanted to emphasize, while we, it wasn't the same thing as in the, in the UK, um, cooperative education programs are at some of the universities and, and in particular the one I went to and the one that produced a lot of the people that work in the digital tools area was the University of Cincinnati um, in their aerospace program. So I, I have my aerospace right. engineering degree. So cooperative programs, if, if you're a student listening to this, what Kevin said about getting that year of experience or two years of experience while you're in school really does help put everything in context. And it's it's how I found uh, the, the application of computers. Um, I'm a couple of years older than you are, but, but it was just amazing that you could do things with simulation that you couldn't do um, in an expensive flight test. And so, um, you know, I, I spent a lot of years in flight controls and then I moved into the car business as they got more and more electronics, ironically, 1988. So I, I wanted to ask you about digital tools. So so you now you've got an enterprise that builds parts for, for car, or for, excuse me, for aircraft companies, maybe car companies too, but they also, your parts are, are plastic injection molding and those kind of things. And I think some of them are service parts or, or repairs. Do you use digital tools or, or are you still using paper drawings or, or what kind of digital tools helps your enterprise? Well, it's quite interesting. Um, some of the digital tools are just that. Digital. <laughs> Fingers. Right? He's, okay. he's showing, uh, wait, wait, wait. We're, 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 an audio, we're an audio podcast. So when you make a visual <laughs> joke, he just put his fingers up and said digits. So. Yeah, well, because, that's, um, that's a good point. <laughs> some, of the parts, some of the parts we get, um, uh, let's say our, our facility in Oklahoma is responsible for looking after the general aviation population, which is probably the um, aerospace analog of cars. Mm-hmm. And they're, they tend to be owned by people that are absolutely maniacal about aircraft all the way through to high wealth individuals that use mm-hmm. it for transportation. Uh, and a lot of the aircraft we deal with, you know, they go back to the late 50s, early 60s. Uh, there were no such things as digital renditions right. back in the day. I mean, it was all vellum, sometimes not even that disciplined to, mm-hmm. to manufacture them. Mm-hmm. So actually, we get parts that come off aircraft and people just hand us one and say, can you make one of these? There is no drawing. So when I was talking about, uh, you know, getting your fingers out, that is the, the, the closest digital rendition you get of some of the parts. So we really are dealing with uh, almost like a, a, a real 3D. You're actually dealing mm-hmm. with the actual part. A sample, right. Exactly. And we're also uh, working very closely with uh, the OEMs in the general aviation market, one of the largest being Textron. And we actually get full models, full digital renditions, um, and so we we're really dealing with the uh, Stone Age all the way up to the most current <laughs> digital tools and everything in between. Uh, but we have to deal with um, digital renditioning and modeling of that all the way through to actually creating, in many instances, a digital rendition of something that never had been digital in the first yeah, place. And do you do that from scratch or do you... There are scanners, later scanners, things like that. I mean, how, how do you get that first sample or the, excuse me, the digital representation of the sample they give you? Well, <clears throat> what we've done in, in the past is, we're going back a ways, is we would actually go through uh, almost, um, if you will, a hand-measured mm-hmm. uh, okay. full draftsman version that then would turn that into something that you could use digitally. Now we use a handheld laser scanner that can create a full 3D model of the finished part. 
from which we can create negatives that create the thermoforming mold. It also allows us to create a rendition that you can then inspect against. So we can use uh, we can use that at the same time. So, so our so, involvement with the tools is varied. Yeah, yeah. So help help the listeners also understand. So some of these are repair parts, but OEMs also get parts from you, aircraft folks like Boeing or or whoever. Do they send you digital models? Do they send it to you consistently? Uh, I would say the answer to that is, uh, and I think you probably already know the answer is absolutely not. <laughs> Why not? Um, why don't they do this? <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I mean, if you if you think about a lot of the aircraft that are that are out there right now, I mean, they've been in production many yeah. of them for multiple years, and um, I know that when uh, you're looking at what I would say is um, either special use aircraft that use a current existing platform, mm -hmm. or you're you look, you're looking at a derivative which uses pre existing parts. Uh, you go through that horrible um, uh, ROI decision as to do I digitize or don't I digitize? Right. And uh, if you if you think about it, some of the early um, qualification testing was done on a non-digitized version, and mm -hmm. you can't really deviate from it. Otherwise, you reset your certification. And wow. that's some of the challenges <laughs> that we have. Uh, when we're looking at the FAA certification of what we call PMA or parts manufacturing authority parts right. that enables us to sell a part to a user that they can legitimately use on their aircraft because there has to be some history that you know how to build the part. And yeah. if you don't have the original part and the original drawing, you don't have a certification path to uh, be able to license that part. It's interesting you point this out that the, the folks that like the fiddle on their cars and they like to fiddle with their their performance. This exact same issue comes up where as they start to use parts that aren't certified for emissions, then it end up creating a, a, a problem both for themselves and for the OEMs. And so this is interesting. The digital world probably could help, but then how do you teach the digital rendition, the, the digital twin, if you will, that that retrofit you did in the backyard yesterday on your car, right? I mean, I mean, it, the, the the car companies, we, we have struggled for years with how do you do that? Well, you know, you've got more sensors now on a car. So if, for instance, if somebody changes the wheels and they're a little different in size, well, you'll probably know that the first 100 miles after they drive it, right? Now, what do you do with that information? I, I'm not quite sure, but, but um, you know, it's just interesting how, how retrofitting after manufacturing or even after mainstream service uh, is one of those challenges that I think digital technologies could help with. But it comes back to your point about, well, it's got to be like the old part because the old part has the trust, or if you will, or the certification. That's interesting. Yeah, it's, so, a lot of it is, is cre recreating the heritage. Right. And uh, if we can manufacture a part digitally and do a first article inspection on it and show equivalence. Right. Um, some of it is cosmetic, some of it is strength testing. Yeah, but you almost have to go back to ground zero to prove that what you just built from the digital model is in fact uh, as equivalent as you can make it to whatever you had. Yeah, and I, it's, it's, it's interesting, you know, as you get a digital model and then you can run simulations, so, so finite element analysis, things like that, you can find weaknesses in old designs, and yet because they never failed in the field, people don't want to change them, right? <laughs> and, and yet right. Uh, the simulation would tell you, you know, you really should make that a little better. Um, so so um, we always talk a little bit about the pandemic and you and I had exchanged some emails and I, I asked you this question um, <clears throat> about what could OEMs do that would help your company better? And um, especially in the current climate, you had an interesting response, which, which I think people in the digital space would be interested in. Can, can you share that with us? What, what would you like the IM, OEMs, so aircraft OEMs, to do better, especially given the current pandemic? Well, I think, to be quite frank with you, the, the, pandemic, the pandemic and the remote working has amplified an underlying challenge that mm -hmm. uh, a lot of collaborative tools have got, which is bandwidth limitation. And I know that when uh, probably yourselves with, with using Zoom and uh, you know everybody else using everything from WebEx to go to and some of the freebies that are out there, 
ended up uh, going through this horrible phase early on where things dropped, you lost sync with uh, audio and video, you just right. couldn't get on, the system was clunky. And what we're seeing uh, in some of the interaction with some of our uh, customers is not necessarily keeping up. The tool may be capable, but you're, you're, you're missing out on your ability to transmit. So we've, we've had some customers where uh, you can't use the tool during business hours because they're using it. If we want to interface and send documents or upload a drawing, which tends to be a fairly high, uh, high, high um, bit count uh, transaction, right. uh, we have to do it after hours. So to me, that was, that was a bit of a pain in the neck. I mean, you're putting in the tools to be streamlined, and the first thing you do is not be streamlined. Right. So uh, I think that was a challenge. And the other one that that's, uh, has cropped up recently, because we've gone through some personnel changes, is... Uh, some of our customers issue us a physical entity called a token. Mm -hmm. And it's it's something you either plug into a device that uh, registers you as a valid user, or you have to put in a, a QA, uh, questions answer on a particular mm -hmm. digit, digital number. And sometimes you have to be given a VPN access, but it's very personal to you. So if you change people, the token uh, uh, can't be transferred. Right. There's all sorts of uh, rules. Yeah. Uh, this, so this all of a sudden, the, you're, you immediately can't do business. Yeah, this is the old school security, and and right. we could we could spend several hours on adequate security and and modern security. But um, yeah, I I uh, these bandwidth things and the the licensing things. That's what's behind those those last two points you made. Um, you know, that's a sort of a wake up call to the people. Uh, and I used to do this, right? You know, as you as you work with vendors, um, you, you want to you really well. This whole idea of software as a service. So our kids or our friends who play games online, they by and large have fixed these bandwidth issues, and yet they're very right. interactive. They're very graphical, and so you, you should ask yourself, well, how did they fix them? Well, software as a service is part of the answer. The other part of the answer is the big kids, Microsoft. Amazon, <laughs> you know, they, these guys that are doing stuff in the cloud, and by the way, the, the cloud's more secure than those other security things you just brought up. Um, so rendering through a cloud service, um, a, a 3D design you can interact with and yeah. comment on would really be sharp. We've actually interviewed a couple of those those guys. They're, they're, they're technology companies, and um, they're going to take off. And the longer the pandemic last the quicker they're going to take off um and whether the oem sponsors it or somebody like you picks up on them uh you know they they uh, uh i think software as a service with adequate security which by the way exists and and you know people like to debate that but but it does exist you just got to use it um <clears throat> you know i think that's where that's going now you you and barry uh one of our our board members with the digital enterprise society uh, you've known each other for a long time, and and part of what you guys have talked about is, uh, if if I could, professional resiliency. You know, how do you keep going um, through different transitions, right? And yeah, and I think I think that's the other thing that some of our our listeners are dealing with are the transitions caused by by changing businesses, and, and goodness, especially with with uh, the challenges at, at Boeing. I mean, they got like like three strikes already, right? I mean. Uh, so, so I thought it would be good for you to talk about, you know, how do, how do you manage a transition, and and what's your experience? What's your advice to maybe aerospace folks like our our age group, fifty and above, who who might be trying to figure out what to do next? What, what's you What do you suggest? Yeah, I'm I'm also in that group, as you can tell. Uh, you would do if you were on video. You could see that I have very little hair. Okay. But, um, <laughs> But the one thing we do have is um, we've arrived at where we're at, mm -hmm. right? And if you're, if you're talking about a gathering of life, life lessons, we, we have them. And I think one of the things that we've been able to do, we've been fortunate in this industry, is uh, as we were talking about the parts, you're talking about heritage, you're talking about uh, true, tried and true uh, capability. It's almost the same for the people in the industry is that those experiences you've gone through, the tools you've learned, the certifications you've been part of, 
the engagement in the industry that you've been part of becomes part of the value add that you provide. Mm -hmm. uh, it's not that you know more tools than the other guy. It's just that you know how the tools break. Mm -hmm. You know how they work right. well. And you know the interaction between uh, various parts of the, uh, of the environment. So the, the resiliency, I think, comes in really understanding uh, how to value the problems you've solved. And how do I, how do I distill down uh, all of my experience into value adds? Because okay. that then becomes discipline agnostic. And so, you know, one of the examples I used on the, uh, the conversation I had with Barry the other day was, I'm a quality engineer. What do I do? Right? Well, the answer is I inspect stuff. I measure things to drawings. I create uh, metrics. I provide feedback to my customer, my internal uh, guys. I do quality engineering stuff. Well, I, I, what I hypothesized was if you were to distill out what that guy does, what he really does is he solves problems. Right. Um, he's able to communicate across multiple levels. He's able to distill the complicated into simple metrics. And he's able to do so with discipline and, and, and uh, at multiple levels in the organization. So what I was to say is if, if the guy were to go for a job and he would describe it in the former, which is I do all of these quality engineering things, he's going to become another quality engineer. But if he were to able to distill down what he, were to, what he was able to deliver in terms of those other value adds, hmm. he can immediately shake off the mantle of the original job if he wants and start looking for something where what he really offers is a significantly broader capability to a potential employer. So, so, did, if you, so have, did you just, did you happen into this or did, did somebody coach you that this is something you, you need to do throughout your career is know your strengths, know know that they're broader than the current assignments you've been given, right? Well, I think a lot of it, again, it comes down to the, the little intro, which is um, as you go through your career, uh, I was, I've made several uh, significant changes. One is I went from the UK environment to the US environment. Uh, I went from engines to airframes. I went from <laughs> engineering to sales, and now I'm running a business. And each one of those, almost required you to shake off what you did before, but build on it. Mm -hmm. And in many instances, I think uh, many of us in our career have been very fortunate to either hang on to a mentor, to someone that saw mm -hmm. something in you that you hadn't necessarily seen in yourself. They're the ones that told you what those qualities were. And I think uh, you're able to self-identify the more of those experiences you go through. So if you can hang on to a mentor or someone that's willing to work with you you can distill in a conversation with them what they are likely to be. And in most recent times, going through this uh, COVID challenge, a lot of really great talent have found themselves on the market and they don't really know what to do. And a few colleagues that I've worked with, they said, well, I don't know what to do. I don't know how to describe what I do. And we had uh, some Q&A and I said, well, can you do this? Have you done that? And I said, what if you were to just write down what we spoke about? It is not a resume. It yeah. is a set of bullets of it's... really wonderful values that anyone would rip their arm off to get a hold of if mm -hmm. they knew that's what you did. Right. But most people on LinkedIn do a classic resume. It's a list of where they've worked. Yeah, where they've worked, not what they right. did, right? <laughs> right. So if you were to do a, if you could be bothered to find the right person and ask them the question, you'd find some outstanding talent. Yeah. So what I was saying to this person I was talking to is, what if you got ahead of that game? What if you told people hmm. this is what your values were and what you've learned over the history of your career? Interesting. And, you, and what they have to then do is say, are those the values that I want? Yeah. So and, it, and it's connecting the dots. So it's really interesting that this is where the conversation went because I was planning for sort of my closing question, which always is, what advice do you have to people who are trying to grow their careers? And it's interesting, as you did this, you, you sort of answered half of the question I was going to ask. But what's been burning in my mind to ask you, Kevin, is I think we have a lot of listeners who would like to do sort of a transitionary thing in their career. Like you said, you went from engineering to sales, and then now you're the CEO of a company. I imagine there's a lot of people who go, wow, I wonder how one goes from an engineering job to running 
either a business unit or or a business. And so I was going to ask you, let's take it back to some of the younger listeners, because we have a lot of people who are earlier stage in their career mm -hmm. who listen to this. If they want to eventually run a business unit or run an entire company, what are some of the things they need to be doing? And you may have already answered that question. Well, uh, it's interesting, uh, actually, because uh, I got asked that question uh, several months ago, actually before COVID, it probably might be a bit different now. Uh, and I was asked, how did you get where you were? And I said, I've always been of the opinion in life, you're given a handful of what I would say is uh, follow that path or that path kind of decisions. Mm -hmm. You know, and, and as I was just saying, you know, I could have declined the offer to move to the States to do some work. It was only a six months of comment, but it lasted 30 years. <laughs> I could have declined it. Um, I could have stayed comfortable where I was at. Um, I had an opportunity to move from engineering to sales because they needed somebody. And I thought that would be kind of fun. And in our industry, sales is technical. Mm -hmm. right. you know, you, uh, technical so you have to too. have that uh, credibility. So the, the, the leap wasn't that huge, but it, what it does is it gets you into talking with more people. And over, over time, you become comfortable with speaking with strangers, you become comfortable with public speaking, you become comfortable with um, being part of a team. And those are the things that people look for in running a business. So, you know, so, so, so that, that's where it's, where it's at. You become the, the, what I say, the individual contributor with your computer and a few drawings to someone that's comfortable in a, in a much broader environment. Now, now, then COVID happened and we've all yeah. started this. How do we work with each other that same way, the collaborative way in, in teams? And um, it's been weird. It's been awkward. <laughs> <laughs> what have what have you figured out, Kevin? In in terms of, I mean, we're doing this via Tom's Zoom channel. We can see each other as as we record the audio portion. But but what other tips and techniques would you have you discovered in helping your company continue to run during this? Well, the last six months, right? I mean, we we've, we've been at this this isolation thing for quite a while now. It's 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 quite difficult. And I think a lot of people have gone through uh, quite a challenging uh, transitionary period. Some people take to it like ducks to water. Others absolutely shy away from it and can't take it whatsoever. They like that physical interaction. Right. And Zoom is just isn't going to cut it. But the one thing I will say, emails and texts do not cut it. Right. Do not cut it. And um, so, I mean, I spend my entire life on, uh, you know, WebExes or the equivalent. Mm -hmm. um, but I think a lot of it is, is phones connecting and, um, we, we try and, uh, bring people together in small groups and one-on-ones. It, it, it is just very, very difficult, um, to really engender the same philosophy as teams. You know, I, I like what you said about, um, the video portion. I mean, we're, we're sitting here having a great conversation today. We're in different parts of the country and we are communicating though with our hands and our eyes and our mouths. One of the um, both frustrating and fascinating aspects of all the mask wearing is you you take away 50% of the communication because <laughs> we do use our mouths to communicate. And, I don't I don't mean words, I just mean smile. smiling and right. groaning and all, and all that stuff. In, right? in fact, a really, a really quick story, Craig, I was in the supermarket the other day and I accidentally, I'm not sure if I cut them off or they cut me off on the way to the avocados. But don't uh -huh. get don't get between me and, and some ripe avocados. But it was kind of one of those things that in a normal situation, you'd look at each other and you'd smile and you'd laugh. And we both looked at each other. My first thought was, how dare they? And I know they were grumpy towards me. And I literally said to them, I'm smiling under the mask. It's no big deal. And then they laughed. And she came up to me later in the store and said, oh, my God, I wonder how many times I think people are being grumpy who aren't because I can't see their mouth. And I'm like, right. there you go. Exactly. So, exactly. so, so then Zoom is better because we can we can watch each other's mouths and still be safe. That's kind of a weird conclusion. <laughs> <laughs> but, but I think well, I think you nailed it. I think you nailed it. I mean, we have we have communication tools where we mm -hmm. fail to communicate, and it it is the combination of of visual, the unsaid, and the verbal. Right. And, and uh, with that together, and, and one of the great things about some of the current tools is we can also pull up a document and share it 
I mean, we were we were critiquing a legal document yesterday, and there were three of us on the line, and we were walking through it, and you could you can follow the line as you're going down it. The tools can actually make you incredibly productive. Um, one of the one of the disadvantages, I'm actually in in the facility today, but one of the disadvantages you have is you suddenly realize actually how productive you can be when you're remote. Yeah. Uh, yeah. If you've got the personal discipline to actually get to your desk and do the work, you can be very, very productive. Uh, but you're missing out on the water cooler stuff and the how the kids and, well, and so forth. You know, and uh, some kids, some some companies, to their credit, have been holding Zoom water cooler discussions. They just act, you know, their their last 15 minutes, and and the whole purpose is just how are you? Are you doing okay? You know, we're from different regions of the world, so there's a two-minute summary of the United States and Germany and wherever else people are. So um, I do think I think leaders and I, I think participants just need to be creative. Keep the teams communicating, keep them collaborating, and use Zoom if you can't do it physically. And now, depending on where you are in the country and in the world, there are places where you can get ten people together, and you can even be in a large enough room you don't need masks on. But but um, there's other places, uh, especially college towns like where I live. That's not probably not the case. <laughs> Anyways, so yeah. Kevin, this has been a joy to chat with you. I'm, I'm glad we got connected through Barry. Thanks, Barry. And um, Tom, any last points? No, I thought this was a great conversation. Kevin, any last uh, nuggets of wisdom for the listening audience? I would say, um, I was just looking at the world that we're in, uh, that we're dealing with in our company is, uh, if you ever thought uh, change was going to come, uh, COVID and what's going on in our particular uh, industry mm -hmm. just about amplifies it. So uh, if you think change is hit, get ready for the next tranche and <laughs> yeah. uh, I, I get ready for your next transition. Um, it'll, it, it's going to be, uh, it's going to be a ride. Yeah. But, uh, and forward, talk about your skills. Yeah, you're, oh, yeah. You're talking about your skills instead of where you've been, right. it's actually better. I mean, that is good advice. Talk talk about your skills. And then also you said, you know, be willing to get out of your comfort zone. I think for most of us, even if we weren't willing, we've been knocked out of the comfort zone this year. So, Right. You translate what you do into what your what your potential new employer wants. Mm -hmm. And uh, not in not in your speak, in his speak. <laughs> yeah. Well, good Kevin, advice. Kevin Wright from Vantage Associates, thank you so much for joining us here on the Digital Enterprise Society podcast. And Thank you to everybody who tuned in. We'll be back next week because we want you to join us every week for more thoughts, ideas, and information in and around product lifecycle management, the Digital Enterprise Society. Remember, it is the place for the exchange of ideas around digital manufacturing tools. Check us out at digitalenterprisesociety.org. You've been listening to the Digital Enterprise Society podcast. Learn more about what you've heard here today at digitalenterprisesociety.org. Join us again next week for more connection without boundaries and creation without limits.